I trust this statement will clarify the situation in which I find myself. It was with some reluctance that I signed the original transcript, and I think my own version of the relevant facts may perhaps be clearer. Detective Constable Watson was very patient and polite when I came into Reading Police Station, but I'm afraid I cannot see him as a serious contender for the Booker Prize. All I'm trying to do is to clarify the complex sequence of events it has been my unhappy lot to experience. My wife Catherine and myself, we have no children, had decided to spend a week in northern France. It would have been ungrateful not to invite Catherine's mother, Mary, to join us. She had been living with us for the past seven years, and although Catherine and I knew how good it would be to have a holiday on our own, we never seriously considered such an arrangement. Mary was in her mid-seventies, her health progressively going downhill, with her memory sadly degenerating. In any case, she deserved a break just as much as we did. She had been wonderfully kind to us, especially after the death of her husband, when she'd sold her Georgian property in Cheltenham and given us £45,000. The only hiccup in the plan was that Mary insisted absolutely that she must fund the whole holiday herself. It was a bit of emotional blackmail, yes, but it was a generous offer, and we finally agreed to it. Yet in reality it wasn't all that generous. I had recently bought a spanking new three-berth caravan. Any B&B or hotel bills would therefore be nil. We were booked for an 8am crossing. We left Chelsea at 3am precisely, and with traffic virtually non-existent, we had ample time to take a break for coffee and croissant at a deserted service station. At Dover, we found ourselves drawn up in third place in the ferry queue. Wide awake, and happily anticipating the holiday, the sky was light now, with the sea calm, and prospects appearing well-nigh perfect. At 7.05am, the Tannoy informed waiting vehicles that boarding was imminent and that documents should be ready for customs and passport clearance. Catherine turned to her mother. Give me your passport then, Mum. I heard a groan of semi-panic behind me, and after a couple of minutes, a high squeak of semi-hysteria. Oh, no! I must have... It must still be... Oh, no! Catherine and I climbed the metallic stairs to the upper deck, where we ordered two full Monty breakfasts in the restaurant. As the Met Office had forecast, the crossing was smooth, and we arrived ten minutes early in Calais, where we passed through customs and immigration without the slightest difficulty. Just over an hour later, a spotty-faced youth pointed the way towards our plot on the caravan site. When I pulled up on the parched little area that would temporarily be our home, my shoulder muscles finally managed to relax, and as Catherine unfastened her safety belt, I found myself smiling ruefully as she leaned across and kissed me, before opening her passenger door and walking down the side of the rover to the caravan. When she came back to the car, her cheeks were a ghastly white. She's dead, John. Mum's dead. Inside the caravan there was a low wooden box, about eight feet long, on which three persons could sit reasonably comfortably, and inside this box was ample space for us to store duvets, blankets, pillows, etc. It was here that Mary had reluctantly agreed to conceal herself before our embarkation at Dover. We must have been mad, I agree, yet we had one slim consolation. When I entered the caravan, it seemed clear to me that she could not have died from suffocation. The lid still lay alongside, and the expression on her face was free from any trace of pain or panic. We could only hope and pray that she had died comparatively peacefully from, well, from something like a stroke. What could we do? What should we do? What did we do? 
After anchoring the separated caravan, Catherine and I walked around the site, desperately debating the situation, and finally agreeing on the most cowardly course of all. We returned to the car and drove off, minus caravan, for the Coq d'Or, a restaurant I had already earmarked as the best in the immediate locality. But we could peck only occasionally at the veal as our thoughts continued to circle round and round in our heads. As we drove back, we found we had agreed at last on the course of action we should have taken many hours previously, to report everything to the nearest French authorities. We just wanted to tell the truth, to face the music, to accept whatever we had to accept, above all, to be able to arrange, some time, somewhere, a decent burial service for Mary. It was dark when we were checked in, wordlessly by the same spotty-faced youth, but the site was well lit, and we had no trouble finding our plot, number 36, just beneath a high beech hedge. But there was no caravan in number 36. Plot number 36 was completely deserted. Luckily, a few places, cars only, were still available on the Dawn Ferry at Calais where I explained as best I could that my holiday plans had been curtailed because of a family bereavement. But you had a caravan, monsieur? I nodded. Left it with my friends. We were allowed to proceed without further ado. Once back home, I rang you immediately and spent over two hours with D.C. Watson. I was invited to read through my statement and to initial any changes that I wished to be made. There were so many changes, though, that I suggested it might help if I submitted my own version. You are reading that version now. Signed, John Graham. When Detective Chief Superintendent Stratton first read through the statement, he'd known that the situation would be far from easy to handle. The corpse was in a foreign country, was not even officially registered dead, was still nowhere to be found, and might well have been sprinkled with concentrated curry powder in order to confuse any intelligent sniffer dog before being fed into some Gallic timber shredder. Yet now, after a leisurely second reading, he found himself pushing his bifocals a little further down his nose, and then, yes, even smiling slightly. It was at least well-written stuff, certainly of a higher literary quality than he'd come to expect from his own underlings. He rang the newly appointed detective inspector, summoning him into the sanctum sanctorum pronto. Stratton held up the staple pages of Graham's revised version. You've already, uh, yes, sir. What do you make of all this? Needle in the proverbial, as far as I can see, sir, unless those Frenchies come up with something... They know the reg of the caravan, and Stratton interrupted him irritably. Just listen a minute, will you, Lewis? Mum in law in the mid seventies, okay? Yes, sir. Memory going down ill sharpish? Yes, sir. Selling her posh Cheltenham place at the top of the housing market? Yes, sir. Then insisting on paying for a joint holiday? Lewis nodded. So, do you reckon there's just a possibility she's got a few spare spondulics somewhere that some people might want to get their greedy paws on? Well, I... What are the three main motives for murder, Lewis? Well, jealousy, sex, money. That's what my old boss used to say. Agree, Lewis, but there's only one of that immortal trio that's running through all this bullshit. Stratton flicked a statement with a podgy right forefinger. Tell me, what do you think this splendid fellow of ours, Mr. Gray, Graham, sir, left Chelsea at, uh, what was it, two, three, three a.m., I think, sir. The small hours, the dark hours, that's all I'm saying. Yes, sir. Ah, forget it. You're new, Lewis. And no one's going to blame you for that. But we've all got to start learning somewhere. So what do you do? One, you try to find out how much Mrs. Uh, What's-her-name's got stashed away somewhere. Two, you'll find out, as confidentially as you can, whether the old gal's last will and testament isn't exactly disappointing reading, as far as her only daughter is concerned. Third, but Lewis was bemused, 
You don't mean, sir? That's exactly what I do mean, Lewis. We've got a murder on our hands. Listen, we're never going to find the old gun in France. Know why? Because she never left England in the first place. Just think, who saw her leaving Chelsea, eh? Nobody. Who saw her on the ferry crossing? Nobody. Who caught a single glimpse of her once she was over the channel? Nobody. As he walked back to his office, Lewis realised uh, that Stratton was a clever enough cop, one who had just put a wholly different perspective on events, but one who could never hold a candle to his old boss. Sergeant Kate Lucan looked up when he came in. She'd been in the force long enough to make some shrewd assessment of any newcomer. All right, the latest D.I. was unlikely to become the brightest star in the firmament, but he was pleasant and honest and, well... Clever enough. As she watched him, though, she witnessed a colleague who was not exactly over the moon. And very soon afterwards, she sensed that he was pretty amateurishly learning next to nothing about whether some recently deceased old lady had bequeathed a healthy bank balance to an only daughter, or instead, perhaps, had become a posthumous patron of the donkey sanctuary. 48 hours later, the message came through from the French police. The missing person had been found, lying serenely dead in an elongated box inside a caravan a dozen kilometres from San Nicolas Yo Somme. Identification was firmly established by the passport found in the caravan. Somehow it seemed to have slipped through the lining of a very expensive, albeit rather ancient, cashmere overcoat. It was Kate Lucan, who passed the email to the detective inspector, the latter reading it through with more than a hint of gratification. Exactly what I told him, he mumbled to himself. Good news, uh, Lewis? You did say it would be all right if I called you Lewis? Of course it is. It's just that, well... A lot of people here still think your Christian name is your surname. Like, you know, that TV sergeant in Inspector Morse. Early that same evening in the station lobby, one of the telephonists smiled a farewell to her now favourite policeman. Good night, sir. And he smiled back at her. After all, it hadn't been a bad day at all. For Detective Inspector Lewis David Robinson. <laughs>